Okay, so uh, like I said, here is my uh, website here. You can find my email address there. It's just cs.sfu.ca slash maxwl. My email address is just maxwl at sfu.ca. Oh, or you can just Google my name. That works too. Um, uh, okay, so uh, we were talking about sequencing based genomics assays. So there are a lot of different uh, kinds of these sequencing based genomics assays that let us understand different types of biochemical activity occurring around the genome. So some examples are RNA-seq, which measures transcription, CHIP-seq, which measures transcription factor binding or histone modification, DNA-seq, FAIR-seq, and now ATAC-seq that measure the accessibility of the genome, and HI-seq, which measures the 3D conformation of the genome in the nucleus. I'm going to be talking about that a little later. So I think a lot of people here are familiar with this type of assay, but just for anyone who isn't, uh, just to give an example of kind of how these uh, experimental approaches work, uh, here's an example of one of ChIP-seq. So in this case, I'm going to be talking about how uh, ChIP-seq measures uh, where some protein of interest binds. In this case, we're looking at the protein P53. So here is uh, a cell uh, in some tissue, maybe it's uh, liver cells in a human, and the, the DNA is here in the nucleus, it's wrapped around nucleosomes, and it's bound to our protein of interest, which is the blue, uh, the blue dot, the P53. So the way ChIP-seq works is we uh, cross-link and fragment the genome. Everything else and sequence those uh, uh, fragments of DNA and then map them back to the human reference genome. So, for example, if we saw this particular sequence here uh, and that maps to this position on the reference genome, that's evidence that that position was bound to P53 in these cells. So we pile up all these reads and we get uh, basically a vector across the genome of how strongly each position in the genome is bound to P53. And you get these peaks like this where, uh, where all the P53 binding sites are. So a huge number of tissues have been uh, profiled using these genomics assays. Here is a figure from uh, Roadmap Epigenomics Consortium, which is sort of a, a sister consortium to ENCODE. Uh, here's a list of all of the human tissues they profiled. Uh, there's a ton of them, including brain, heart, liver, also uh, embryonic tissues. Uh, so we have really a huge amount of data now about the genome. <clears throat> uh, so my research focuses on trying to understand the activity of the human genome uh, using these data sets. So we can think about all this data as basically a big matrix over the genome, where the horizontal axis is genomic positions and the vertical axis uh, in this figure are the different genomics assays, so uh, CHIP-seq for different targets, RNA-seq, ATAC-seq, and so on. Uh, and so what we have is basically uh, we have hundreds of measurements per tissue, and the genome is uh, about 3 billion base pairs long. So we have hundreds times 3 billion uh, values in this big matrix, and hopefully we can leverage this using uh, machine learning approaches to try to uh, improve our understanding of the human genome and how it's regulated. Uh, so I'm going to, oh, something happened here. Um, I'm going to, uh, this talk is going to be sort of uh, two parts. One is a deep dive into uh, one uh, project about how domains influence gene expression. Uh, and then depending on how much time we have, I have a quick sampler of a bunch of other projects, uh, uh, types of uh, uh, areas of research that I'm interested in. So starting with this first, uh, this first topic. Um, so uh, the, the topic is about uh, chromosome domains, so big regions of uh, between 100,000 to a million base pairs and how they influence gene expression. And the method, uh, the computational method I'll be talking about is called entropic graph-based posterior regulation. This is a uh, joint project between me, my two advisors, Jeff Bilms and Bill Noble at UW, Dave Gilbert, who is a, a collaborator of ours on the biology side at Florida State University, Michael Hoffman, who was a postdoc in the Noble Lab and is now at University of Toronto, 
and for Hot, who was also a postdoc in the Noble Lab and is now at a research institute associated with UCSD. So we've known for a long time that what region of the genome a gene lives in influences its gene expression. So you can take the same gene with the same promoter sequence and put it in one part of the genome and it'll be expressed, uh, whereas you can put it in another part of the genome and it will be repressed. Uh, so these regions of either activity or repression are sometimes called domains and they're on the, uh, they have sizes on the scale of again between 10,000 to a million base pairs. And uh, domain regulation is much less well understood than the regulation of a gene by its promoter. In particular, it's often uh, very hard to figure out how regulatory elements within a domain are uh, deciding which genes they should uh, influence the activity of. So, oops, all my animations, I guess, are going to go away because this has got converted to PDF. So, uh, try to ignore this box here. So, <laughs> even though it's covering up what you're trying to see. So, uh, so one of our best tools for understanding domain regulation is people have categorized different domains according to genomics assays. So there are a lot of different domains that have been identified that are covered up by this box here. Uh, I'm going to talk about some of them, uh, but in general, the, uh, the point of this table is that there are a lot of different types of domains that have been identified and each type is defined on just a single data type. So perhaps one uh, type of histone modification or one type of uh, uh, chromatin confirmation data. So uh, what we wanted to do was try to improve our understanding of domains by integrating all these do domain types into a single comprehensive understanding of domains in the genome. Uh, so our tool for doing this is a, ca a class of methods that we call semi-automated genome annotation methods. You may have heard of Segway. Uh, so uh, semi-automated genome annotations, uh, annotation algorithms take as input a collection of uh, genomics uh, data sets represented as real valued vectors over the genome. They partition the genome and assign an integer label to each segment such that positions with the same label have similar patterns in the signal data. So there are a couple of uh, methods that have been described for this, including HMM-SEG, Chrome HMM Segway. Uh, most of the work I'm going to be talking about is built off of Segway, which was developed by Michael Hoffman and uh, myself. <clears throat> um, so we call them semi-automated because they are, it is an uh, unsupervised approach. By that I mean the algorithm doesn't know uh, what type of elements exist in the genome. We just ask it to identify different patterns and then it's semi-automated because after the algorithm runs, we uh, try to interpret which of these integer labels uh, corresponds to what biological phenom phenomenon. Uh, so you, if you do this at a small scale, I'll talk about this a little bit later, you might find things like promoters and enhancers. We're doing this at a broader scale, at the scale of, uh, again, uh, uh, 100,000 to a million base pairs. Uh, so we're looking for new types of chromatin domains. So the uh, computational approach here is uh, a probabilistic graphical model, uh, specifically a type of uh, model called a dynamic Bayesian network, which is a generalization of a hidden Markov model. So what we assume at each position, uh, or we assume for each position in the genome, and by position I mean uh, between either one base pair or up to uh, uh, 200 base pairs that there is some label uh, in the genome that corresponds to what type of functional element that is and that the observed data sets uh, including histone modification, uh, uh, DNA-seq and transcription factor binding are uh, generated according to what the type of functional element is at that position. So we are interested in trying to use this type of method to understand not the small scale of the genome, but rather the domain scale. So we applied this not at a, a uh, one to 100 base pair resolution, 
but with a resolution of 10,000. So one label here corresponds to the function of uh, 10,000 base pairs in the genome. Uh, we use this input domain related data sets uh, that includes uh, histone modification uh, as well as things like replication timing. Now, uh, that works so far, uh, except that we would also like to incorporate information about the genome's 3D conformation. So what do I mean by that? Uh, so uh, did my slide get out of order here? Okay, I think they did a little bit. So, uh, so the, the genome has a 3D conformation in the nucleus. So here's a, a 3D model of how, uh, uh, how the, the genome is arranged. All the spaghetti, each strand of the spaghetti is a chromosome. And it turns out that the genome's 3D conformation is important for uh, many cellular processes, uh, including gene regulation and DNA replication. And you can see that a lot of these domain types are actually defined according to 3D conformation. So what we wanted to do was uh, create an annotation of uh, domains in the genome uh, incorporating both these 1D genomics data sets, which we can do with that probabilistic model, as well as the high C data, uh, which is represented as a 2D matrix over the genome. So this matrix represents for every pair of positions, we have a high value if those positions are close in 3D uh, and a low value if they're far apart in 3D. Um, I should say, please stop me anytime with questions. Uh, I'm uh, just raise your hand. What, what types we discovered. That's right. So one type of domain, for example, is called constitutive heterochromatin. Uh, this, has been, this was known before. This is def, uh, characterized by the histone modification H3K9 trimethylation. It turns out that big regions of the genome on a scale of about a million base pairs are covered by this histone modification and they're repressed. Um, so that's, that's one mechanism for how when genes uh, end up there, uh, why they're, they're repressed. But I'll talk about a bunch of different categories. Is that answer your question? Any more questions? Yeah. Yes, so this is in eight cell types that we had data for. I think that's gonna be in a couple of slides. Let's just see if I have it on the slides. Uh, yes. Here we go. So most of it's in IMR90, what I'm going to show you the results for. We have it for seven other cell types. I don't have those on the slides. They include um, uh, GM12878, which is a, a human cell line, and a couple others. Any more questions? Uh, okay. So uh, now the way we're hoping to incorporate this information into the annotation is by leveraging uh, a property which has been known for a uh, for quite a while, which is that if positions are close in 3D, they're more likely to be uh, the same domain type. So we can incorporate this information into the model using uh, what we call a pairwise prior. So if positions A and C are close in 3D, then they'll get a high value in the high C contact matrix. Uh, and then what we do is we say in the probabilistic model, we would uh, like it to be the case more often than chance that A and C get the same label. So then we'll get an annotation out that uh, will in general uh, satisfy these pairwise priors. So how can we incorporate that pairwise prior into the probabilistic model? Um, idea number one would be just to throw that information into the probabilistic model. Uh, that could work, but it would have to use approximate inference uh, that's problem number one. Problem number two is uh, that it's hard to decide what the generative process is. And you have to uh, supply some uh, generative distribution in order to put uh, that information into the probabilistic model. So the, instead, the way we tried to approach this was using 
uh, a method called posterior regularization. Um, in particular, uh, the method is called entropic graph-based posterior regularization. Uh, so we pose this problem as a optimization problem where uh, we're, so the way this is going to work is we're going to have some objective function that we're going to optimize uh, and the output of that optimization is going to be a probability distribution over the genome uh, that represents the probability that each position uh, has a particular domain label. So the output of our method is going to be this distribution which we call Q of XH. Our domain labels are XH. So you can think of this uh, a particular instanti instantiation as basically a giant uh, sequence of numbers. In this case, we have five, so it would be, you know, zero, five, two, and so on. <clears throat> um, uh, this can be a probability distribution over those, uh, over those sequences. We're going to pose this as an optimization, so we're going to minimize some objective function with respect to Q. Uh, now, it turns out that you can pose normal probabil probabilistic inference as an objective, uh, uh, as a optimization problem. The way you do that is by optimizing the callback Leibler divergence from Q to a particular probabilistic model, P. So this is the probabilistic model uh, that's represented by this uh, graphical model here. Callback Leibler divergence is a measure of dissimilarity between uh, probability distributions, where the callback Leibler divergence between uh, two distributions that are the same is zero, and it's larger if they're uh, if they're different. So, if we optimize just this objective function that I'm showing you, uh, is Q would end up equal to P because that's the value that minimizes that callback Leibler divergence. Um, but we're additionally adding a form of regularization. So regularization is a very common uh, thing to do in all types of optimization, where you add an extra term to the objective that expresses some property that you would like uh, the solution to have. So in this case, we uh, add a regularization term that penalizes the callback Leibler divergence between the distributions over Q, uh, over XI, so that's QI of XI and QJ of XJ, if there is a high, high C contact or a strong high C contact between positions I and positions J, represented by this weight, uh, WIJ. Um, so if we optimize this objective function, what we end up with is a distribution over the labels that both matches the probability distri distribution pretty well and also respects this pairwise prior. Does this make sense? <clears throat> um, okay, so a couple of uh, nice things about this as a general uh, inference method. So it turns out that uh, this method, EGPR, entropic graph-based posterior regularization, uh, does better than a lot of approximate inference methods uh, on synthetic data. So this is data where we know the, the true value of the variables. So what I'm showing you here is a synthetic model where we vary uh, the noise in the model. It's a hidden Markov model that we generate. Uh, the noise uh, determines the difficulty of the problem. And then what we're measuring is the error of the predictions of the values of the, um, our predictions of the HMM labels. So you can see is that uh, using just no hidden Markov model and just independent positions, that does pretty poorly, that's red. Using a hidden Markov model does better, that's this uh, brownish green color. Then I'm comparing three different types of approximate inference methods, uh, or sorry, one, one approximate inference method, that's a loopy belief propagation, a very popular approximate inference method, and then two types of posterior regularization. Uh, a method that we call SQGPR for squared error graph-based posterior regularization. Uh, that was uh, uh, available before EGPR. Turns out EGPR actually does quite a bit better than either the approximate inference or the alternative posterior regularization method. So that was pretty exciting to see. Um, so if you're interested in uh, this stuff, uh, please check out our paper, especially um, 
th this is the paper on the computational approach. I will also be just uh, talking about this in the UBC STAT seminar in about a month. So uh, check out that talk if you're interested in the machine learning side. <clears throat> okay, so now getting back to domains. Any questions before I move on? Question. So in this case, so the question is, uh, what's the gold standard? How do we know what the error is? So in this, in this case, this is just synthetic data, so we know the answer. Uh, I forget if I have this experiment here, but I have some um, evaluation measures for the actual domains. Uh, of course, in that case, we don't know the true, uh, the true domain types, but we can, we can get a couple of measures of the quality of the domains. I forget if that experiment is in here, but I'll make sure to bring it up when we get to it. Any more questions? Yeah. Just a quick question. So you mentioned um, that the, yeah, the high degree of proteins that are the question is, uh, we see that positions tend to have the same label, are the same domain type when they're close in 3D. You could imagine a case also where different types of, of genomic domains would come together. Uh, so one example at a smaller scale is promoters and enhancers. So those are different types of genomic elements, uh, but they tend to come together in 3D. So you wouldn't want to use this type of model to uh, annotate promoters and enhancers because then the model would try to say, the model uh, would try to put both as promoter and both as enhancer. But it tends to be true for domains. That's just something that's been observed. Any more questions? Yeah. So this case, so all we did here is we took an HMM, we just made a random hidden markup model just defining transition and emission probabilities, uh, generated some data, and then, and then uh, covered up the labels, didn't tell the algorithm what the labels were, and then tried to predict the labels. Um, so this case, you wouldn't call it an unsupervised method. It's more like a probabilistic inference problem. Any more? Okay, so let's go back to domains. So we were trying to understand uh, domain regulation using a annotation of uh, these domains in the human genome. So uh, I have uh, annotation. So what we did is we annotated uh, human lung fibroblast cells, uh, a cell line called IMR90. We used 28 histone modifications, uh, DNA1 and replication time data, as well as high c data represented by EGPR. So we got out a annotation. Uh, just to give you a sense of the scale, uh, this is the median domain, the domain length is about half a megabase, so about 400,000 base pairs per uh, segment in this annotation. So we found five domain types. I'm going to go through what the five types we found were. So three types that we discovered were already, uh, had already been the people had already known about them. Uh, the three types are called quiescent domains, constitutive heterochromatin, and facultative heterochromatin. Uh, so I'm not going to go uh, too deep into these. Uh, constitutive heterochromatin is defined by the histone modification H3K9 trimethylation, facultative heterochromatin by the histone modification H3K27 trimethylation. Um, <clears throat> uh, okay, so then the our uh, novel discovery was a distinction between two types of active domains. Uh, as far as we know, this was not known before in humans. Uh, it had been observed before in fruit flies. So the two active domain types we call specific expression domains and broad expression domains. So, so how, what, how do we find these and what's the difference between them? So we, uh, you can look at uh, this figure, this is what I'm showing here on the horizontal axis are uh, the different uh, input data sets, 
and the vertical axis are the different domain types. So you can see that specific expression domains are associated with uh, high regulatory marks. These are regulation associated data sets uh, as well as transcription associated data sets, whereas broad expression domains are sort of moderate in the regulation associated marks and high just in transcription. So, uh, so what's the difference between these two types of domains? So we can look at how highly expressed are genes that fall into these two domain types. Um, I'm showing here the, uh, along the horizontal axis of the different domain types and the vertical axis how expressed the genes are. And you can see that genes in these domains are both expressed. Uh, so, so far we, we haven't come up with a difference between them. All we see is difference between these active domains and repressive domains. Where we do see a difference is if we ask uh, of those active domains, what fraction are expressed in a small number of cell types and what fraction are expressed in a large number of cell types. So that would be genes that are expressed in IMR90, those are the cells we're interested in, plus a couple of other cell types versus many cell types. Uh, I believe the cutoff here was something like eight out of 32 cell types. So what you can see is that specific expression domains uh, most genes are expressed just in a small number of cell types as well as IMR90, whereas in broad expression domains, excuse me, most genes are uh, expressed in many cell types, uh, close to 32, which is the number of cell types we had transcription data for. So this gives us a model of these two domain types where specific expression domains, uh, genes in specific expression domains are uh, expressed just in this cell type and are often other cell types where broad uh, genes in broad ex expression domains are things like housekeeping genes that are expressed across all cell types. Um, uh, so our, our thoughts about this is that specific expression domains are these regulatory jungles where the cell needs to specify that these genes should be on in a very specific developmental lineage or in response to a very specific stimulus. Uh, so it's a lot of regulatory marks and, uh, uh, and the genes that are regulated by them. Whereas broad expression domains have a lot of housekeeping genes, they might have strong promoters, but there's not a lot of regulation associated with them. Um, so if you're interested in this, check out this uh, paper in Genome Research. Uh, we uh, found out recently that this was named one of the top 10 regulatory and systems genomics papers of 2015, which was pretty exciting. Yes, question. Yeah, how do you check if these domains are in a specific pattern? Like, for example, if you know that there are certain domains that are inactivated in a certain cell type, it tends to be in the outside region of the nucleus, like in the world, while um, housekeeping genes, um, domains that contain housekeeping genes, is so the question is, what uh, part of the nucleus are these domains in? Yeah. So uh, the sort of most, the simplest model that we understand of how the nucleus is organi organized is that inactive regions are shoved off to the periphery of the nucleus and uh, active DNA is pulled into the center of the nucleus. Uh, I believe that's the only distinction we have here. I have these slides at the end of the talk. I'm going to just go all the way and see if I can find these because this answers your question. I'll go back to that in a second. So this is, so uh, there's the two compartment model of the genome based on high C data. So here is a distribution of uh, base pairs that are in each type of domain, what compartment do they fall into? Uh, so what you can see is that broad and specific domains look like they are kind of in the same compartment. Uh, it looks like specific domains are sort of nebulous in the middle. Broad domains are a little bit more in the active compartment. Positive means active. And then you can see that quiescent and constituent heterochromatin is, uh, uh, is decisively in the inactive compartment. Then another plot that might answer your question, go back, is this Lamin, uh, 
uh, Lamin plot, so it, it's, it's a little hard to see because it's so small, is you can see that, so, so what's being shown here is this is an aggregation of what labels are present around uh, Lamin associated domains. So this part in the middle is, uh, is Lamin associated and outside is, uh, is what occurs outside of the Lamin associated domain. So you can see that broad ex expression domains occur sort of everywhere outside, whereas specific expression domains tend to be right at the periphery of the Lamin. So I think that's exactly consistent with what you're saying. Um, any more questions? That's a great question. So I, I give you five domain types. How do we choose five? Uh, so in general, a, qu uh, a question with these unsupervised approaches is how many uh, sort of types of clusters you have, how many, uh, how many annotation types, how many domain types. Uh, there are some methods that will automatically decide on a number for you. In this case, we were just trying to figure out how many different subtypes we could discover. So all I did was I uh, started with a high number and I kept lowering it uh, as long until I could come up with a distinct story for each type. So I'm sure in the higher number, I'm sure there were other distinctions that we just couldn't, we couldn't figure out what was going on, but we, we couldn't figure out what was going on so we couldn't, you know, there's, they, they just looked like there were two that they were the same. So that's, does that answer your question? Any more questions? Um, I don't know if, I'm just gonna keep going until seven. Uh, it seems like people are just asking questions. So we're just gonna do questions in the middle, I guess, if that's okay with you guys. Um, okay, so that's the end of that. Uh, answering your question, I, I guess I don't have this, let's see if I have this, this uh, plot towards the end. Okay, so uh, you wanted to know, how do we evaluate whether or not we're doing a good job using graph-based posterior regularization? So what I'm showing in this plot is, uh, on the vertical axis is how well the annotations represent replication time data, which is a good proxy for domain identity. Uh, and that data was not used as input to the model. Uh, how does that, uh, that metric, uh, the explanation of replication time, that's kind of our gold standard. How does that vary as a function of whether or not we use eGPR? Uh, a question before I continue? Okay, uh, so what I'm showing you here, so we have a, a strength associated with eGPR. Uh, all the way on the left is Segway itself with no eGPR. That's this dashed line. So you can see that uh, Segway by itself does this well. And then you can see that as we increase the regularization strength, uh, our performance improves for a while until we make it too high and then it, it gets worse. So what this shows is that there are some uh, levels of regularization where uh, eGPR helps. And so we use a value around here. I forgot what the value was. Oh, that was, that was um, uh, performance measure number one. There's a couple more in the paper. I don't have slides on those. Was there a question? The question is, what fraction of the genome is specific versus broad expressed domains? Uh, here is that plot. So the vertical axis is the fraction of the genome versus these different domain types. So you can see that broad expression domains are about a third of the genome, specific expression a lot less at 10%. Um, the boundary between these two is probably a little bit arbitrary. Uh, so I, w I wouldn't put too much stock in, in specifically the uh, those those two numbers, and I don't know what Phantom Five uh, decided for broad versus uh, specific expression. Uh, although I think Phantom Five worked at the gene level rather than the base pair level, so that'll be give you different numbers. Any more questions on this? Yeah. yeah this 
Uh, a third of the genome uh, expresses marks that are associated with housekeeping genes. So certainly much, much smaller fraction than genome are actually those housekeeping genes, and, and much smaller even than that are the exons of the housekeeping genes. But what it looks like is that uh, housekeeping genes live in these domains. Certainly there's lots of non-functional stuff in there, but it all has the mark of broad functionality. Any more questions? Okay, so five minutes, I'm going to quickly go through probably one more project. So uh, let's do the project of um, annotating uh, local chromatin state in hundreds of human cell types. So uh, everything I showed you there was annotations of domains, again, at the scale of 100,000 to a million base pairs. But we've also generated uh, annotations at the local scale, annotating things like genes, promoters, enhancers. <clears throat> so we have annotations at this scale of 164 human cell types, uh, total, uh, uh, in total using 1,600 genome-wide assays. Uh, so this is really a huge data set. Um, I think this is a great reference for anyone who uh, is interested in trying to understand uh, some particular genomic locus. So what this looks like in the genome is this. So on the horizontal axis, I have genomic positions, and on the vertical axis, different cell types. So this is 164 different human tissues. And then at the small scale, we've come up with these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine different element types, uh, which include promoters, enhancers, uh, transcribed regions, uh, repressed regions, and so on. So if you have some cell type you're interested in, maybe you're interested in lung cells, maybe brain cells, you can just pull out the annotation uh, of that cell type. And if you have some locus you're interested in, you can see what's going on in, uh, I'm gonna hurry through this pretty quickly. So uh, in addition to that, <clears throat> we have a measure of how functional each, uh, uh, each type of element is. So this functionality score gives a higher uh, score to things like promoters, enhancers, and genes that are functional, and a low score to uh, non-functional things like repressed DNA. Um, so the, this functionality score is defined overall according to uh, evolutionary conservation, evolutionary conservation being uh, a great measure of functionality, but at the, uh, locally it's orthogonal to conservation, which means uh, it's a, uh, if you want to know, if you want to uh, characterize some locus and you want to know not just if it's functional or not, but why it's functional, you can just uh, pull up this plot. Uh, this plot is, this plot I'm showing here that's labeled functionality score is the same as this matrix, except that the labels are scaled according to their functionality. So what you can see is that everything gets squashed except for the functional elements. Uh, you can see that there's a gene here, a promoter here, and what looks like an enhancer over here. Uh, so if you, if all you know is not what cell type you're interested in, but you know, for example, that there's a disease-associated locus at the, this position, uh, you can just pull up this plot and get a good sense of what the functional activity is at this locus. Um, if you're interested in this stuff, uh, check out this website or just Google Segway Encyclopedia. That will take you to this page where you can download the annotations. You can view them in the UCSC genome browser, and there's also a server where you can create that type of uh, functional a functionality score plot. Um, I think we're out of time, so I will leave it at that. Uh, thank you for attention, and I'm happy to take if, questions if there are any others. Yeah, Question. How does that compare to HMM derived chromatin states? By that, you mean chrome HMM? Yeah. So chrome HMM is a uh, uh, method very similar to Segway. Uh, you, they both are, are uh, sort of um, qualitatively the same. Uh, there are a couple of differences in the uh, method. So Chrome HMM uh, takes all the data and turns it into binary values uh, before creating the annotation. We use the actual real values of the data sets. Chrome HMM also works at 200 base pair resolution. 
Uh, Segway can go all the way down to one base, uh, one base pair resolution. I think for those annotations, it's at 100 base pair resolution. Um, so uh, uh, both of them are good. We, we think that Segway is a little bit uh, more sophisticated. Yeah. So the question is on the relationship between uh, the genome confirmation high C data and other uh, sort of connectivity information like protein protein interactions and cell or and uh, gene regulation interactions. So in general, those measure very different types of things. So uh, protein protein interactions measure when the protein products physically interact, whereas high C data measures where the genomic uh, regions physically interact. So it's a, a interesting question to ask, do genes, or uh, do the genes for proteins that physically act, interact, do those uh, regions physically interact in the genome? Um, I don't know the answer to that. That would be an interesting thing to ask. Uh, in general, uh, interaction tends to be only between regions on the same chromosome. So you have, if you have physically interacting proteins, where the genes are on different chromosomes, you won't see those physically interact. Uh, then the same question can be asked of uh, uh, gene regulation signaling networks. So if gene A is a transcription factor and it regulates gene B, uh, uh, the gene for protein A uh, physically interact with the gene for protein B. I don't really answer that either, but again, uh, you could, that could happen on different chromosomes, where, where the, whereas that's unlikely to happen uh, in a nucleus on different chromosomes. That is your question. Question over here. That's a great question, and if uh, I had a couple more minutes, I could tell you about how you can use sub-modular sub optimization to figure out what uh, uh, what assays are most informative to perform. But I didn't I didn't have a chance to, to tell you about it. There should be a slide here. No, if you Google um, uh, genomics assay panel uh, uh, sub-modular optimization bioarchive you'll find a paper on this topic. Yeah. Question, I think there was a question over here. No. Any other questions? All right, uh, thanks, for, thanks for coming, uh, and uh, thanks for the questions.